Hey everybody, this is Mark, and I am going to talk to you today about global marketing, and specifically the way that global marketing can help you develop your business plan. So if you're working on a global business plan, and you want to try to figure out what do I need to include in order to make that work, then the stuff that we're talking about in terms of global marketing will help you put those pieces together. So let's go. So I would like to invite you all to please like and subscribe to this channel. If this is information that's helpful to you, please share it with others. If there's anything you want to learn more about, anything you want to debate about, things you want to ask me about, I'd be happy to make a video. I have areas of expertise in international business, economics, politics, and the entertainment industry. So I even like to talk about music. So if any of you have questions or if you just want to talk about this stuff, let me know. I'll put something together for you. I have read probably hundreds of business plans over many years. And this is the part of the business plan that I think the most people have trouble with. Um, why do people have so much trouble with it? Well, I'm going to ask you this question and let's see where we go with this. So, how do you define marketing and what do you think should be in a marketing plan? A vision board. Okay, we're showcasing our product, we're making it known, we're advertising it, right? All that stuff. Absolutely. What else? It's not always just your product though, it's your okay. whole brand. Lots of companies have the product that they need. How do you become that company that provides that need as well? Well, that's more, even more complicated as you go to other countries because there are other companies that are already there, maybe even native and local, providing that thing that they already need. So how are you going to do that better than the people who are already there? That's a tough question, but that's totally central to the question of marketing. The product is only worth what the consumer is willing to pay for it. <laughs> Excellent. I like that. Okay, because here's the deal, right? We talk about supply and demand and managerial economics, mm -hmm. but price is an important part of marketing too. So I'm going to give you a hint on where we're going with this, right? So you mentioned product and you mentioned price. Um, my friend Jim Cox. How many of you guys had Jim Cox as a professor? Like a few guys, like several. So, so I'm talking about Jim Cox. Um, this is how he defines marketing. He says, marketing is everything that touches the consumer. Mm -hmm. Everything that touches the computer, consumer. Is that just advertising? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It is a lot more than that, okay? So this is what I want to talk about a little bit, is what does it encompass, and how is that going to help you figure out what to do with this thing in your business plans, okay? So you guys are hitting product. And you're hitting price. When you're talking about commercials and advertising, that's promotion. But we're not hitting place. I don't think I heard anything about that one. So you guys sort of indirectly hit several of these things. With product, right, we are talking about issues regarding brand name, variety, quality, features, packaging, sizes, service, warranties, and returns, right? With price, MRP, discounts, allowances, payment period, credit terms, place, we have distribution channels coverage, assortments, inventory, that's part of marketing, transport, locations, okay? And finally, we have promotions, sales promotions, advertising, sales force, direct marketing, public relations. Out of those four things, most people who write a business plan do one of them. And which one do you think they do? Promotion. Promotion. Because we're always thinking about marketing as being like akin to advertising, which it is, right? But it is also much more than that. And so I want to go through these things and think about it internationally. Can you see how all of these might change depending on where you go in the world? Absolutely. How they might be affected differently? Right. Let's start with product, right? So we've kind of defined it already. A product is like a bundle of attributes sell well when their attributes match consumer needs. Consumer needs were the same everywhere, 
a firm could sell the same product worldwide. We talked about that before when we talked about global strategies. One of the central questions of marketing in global management is this question of national integration versus national responsiveness, right? This idea of, you know, can you do the same thing everywhere and make it work? Or do you have to specialize in some way so in order to satisfy various aspects of your target market? So how does the characteristics of the product meet the needs of the target group? If it's a very broad target group, hey, you know, you're in business, it's easy, you know? But if it's more narrow, then it could be really challenging, right? Needs depend on culture, economic development, product and technical standards that are specific to the market. So we're talking about market segmentation, and this has to do with some aspects of demographics that you're pointing out, like how do you figure out who your audience is. So market segmentation, you're identifying distinct groups of consumers who have common purchasing behavior. Globally, segmentation allows to determine whether and how we need to adjust to a regional or local market. And I'm going to quote uh, Dr. Philip Cutler here. Uh, he says, market segmentation is subdividing a market into distinct and homogenous subgroups of customers where any group can conceivably be selected as a target market to be met with distinct marketing mix. So there's, there's that word marketing mix. So there's different types of market segmentation. Let's have a look at this really quick. One way of looking at it is geographically, right? The people in a certain area might have similar interests and things. People outside that area might not. Demographic segmentations, right? We're breaking things down based on demographic groups, age, gender, income, so on. Psychographic segmentation, that consists of grouping the target audience based on behavior, lifestyle, attitudes, and interests. Somebody who is into exercise equipment might not be the same kind of person who is interested in gaming. Right? So trying to find those distinct groups of people and sell to them in a way so you can deliver that product to whoever that is and not put it in front of somebody else, right? that's the psychographic part of it. And then behavioral focuses on specific reactions and the way customers go through their purchasing processes. And that has become, of course, highly digitized in our modern age. So different ways we can appeal to different groups of people. So there's two market, two key market segmentation issues. The first one is the differences between countries in the structure of market segments. So you may have to develop a unique marketing mix to appeal to a certain segment in a given country. It's more of a focus on the differentiation on what is special. Are, is there a certain demographic within a country that is unique enough that it's worth your while or where you feel like you need to specialize in order to address that particular demographic? So one example, uh, black Brazilians, right? Brazil has got a, a diverse set of ethnicities. Um, black Brazilians have different preferences than many of the ethnicities of many of the other areas, and so if this, is, if this is a market that you want to appeal to, then you probably want to adjust your marketing in such a way that it might appeal to that, that segment. Second, the existence of segments that transcend national borders. So when segments transcend national borders, that's known as intermarket segments, a global strategy is possible. Say, for example, if women from 24 to 40 like the same product across international boundaries, right? I could use the same approach to them as I do to maybe several other countries in the world that have the same demographic and seem to show the same interest. There may be some products where it's not necessary to do that kind of thing. You know, we've talked about machine parts before, right? In many forms of, of machines, a lot of parts are standardized. So do you need to specialize on something that's particularly standardized or something that you know, isn't considered a consumer product. As long as it makes my machine work, you know, I don't care if it's blue or it's pink or whatever, right? And so I may be able to take that kind of a product and use it lots of places, not just in a, toward a certain group in, in Brazil. And so that improves my cost advantage when I can basically say, all right, I could just take this thing and use it anywhere, as opposed to saying, well, I gotta spend a little more money figuring out what these people want and how to adjust my product and that kind of thing. So. You know, this illustrates kind of what we've been talking about here so far. What considerations do you think you will have to address in your market in regards to product, right? Things about packaging, size, service, any of the other things that we mentioned. 
are you going to have to change some aspect of your product? Or is it good the way it is? So how do product attributes affect uh, marketing strategy? Some things to think about. You know, so uh, you, need to, you need to look at culture, right? tradition, social structure, language, religion, education. All of these things might affect what you do with your product. Level of economic development. Consumers in highly developed countries tend to demand a lot of extra performance attributes. Uh, consumers in less developed nations tend to prefer more basic products. Again, sometimes due to economic uh, power and ability to pay for things. And third, product and technical standards. National differences can force firms to customize the marketing mix. So you may not want to, but the expectation of that country is that you will, and you have to. There are some examples. like. We have talked before about McDonald's in India, right? You have to change the product to adjust for the culture, right? You're not going to sell beef in India, so you have to do something else. That's a radical cultural change. Last week, we talked about how Coke changes its sweetener based on government laws and regulation and the accessibility of sweetener, right? In the EU, it might be, we're not going to have high fructose corn syrup. You know, in Canada, they actually have reduced the amount of sweetener in Coke. So, or in any colas, in any soft drinks. So Coke had to meet that, so that's a different thing. And elsewhere, sometimes there's just supply chain issues, like, you know, hey, I can't get this, so I'm going to get this, and so maybe a different sweetener. But otherwise, they're largely standardized, but they do have, they, they've been forced to change based on sort of the rules. Um, recycled cell phones um, in the early 2000s were exported to the developing world and sort of continue to be. You know, you people, you know, they power through so many iPhones, right? And they move them on and they're recycled, they get refurbished and sometimes sold in, in developing countries, older models. And here's a question for you, okay? I lived in the UK and I asked myself this question because I saw this stuff on a, on a product shelf. I saw lots of things on a product shelf that I thought were baffling compared to what I see in the United States. Um, why is it that I can't believe it's not butter would be offered in a large circular container in the U.S. and a smaller rectangular container in the U.K. Refrigerators? Smaller refrigerators. That is it. That is the answer. Oh. Okay. That's, smaller refrigerators. That's exactly correct. <laughs> Another part of it is the availability of just being able to go someplace local and shop more frequently. Okay. So, um, in my experience living there, you know, our refrigerator was not this big. It was this big. Right. And we had to manage to find a way to make our food fit in there and make it work. And so the companies would build stuff to make that more efficient. And this big tub is just not very efficient in a very small space. And this container is going to be about this big. And where I was living, like I could literally walk across a park and there was a grocery store right there. And I could, I just walk to the grocery store. Maybe I'd, you know, have a backpack, throw the stuff in the backpack and you know, instead of shopping, you know, weekly or every two weeks or once a month or whatever we do in America with the big freezers and all this stuff, right? You know, you just go down there maybe once a week. If you need like some more perishable stuff, you might just grab a few things in a couple of days. Where I was living, you didn't have to drive any place really in order to, to get food. It was sort of built into the way the cities were planned. Now that's not true of every place in the UK, not true of every place in Europe. There are places that are set up a little more in a suburban layout, kind of like what we have, an urban suburban sort of thing. But in many places, they do a better job arranging their cities in such a way that you can just kind of walk someplace and go get something. It's not a huge hassle to go out of your way to do those things. But there is a sense that like if you go more frequently, then you can get more fresh stuff. And you know, maybe you don't want the stuff to be in your refrigerator as long, which suggests smaller refrigerators. So again, packaging questions being affected by consumer tastes, right? And that's, that's another change that you may have to make to the product in order to try to adjust for the people that you're selling to. Okay, so that was product, so now we talk about price. What is your price? Again, when people write business plans, this is a thing that people often miss. How much am I going to charge for this thing that I am providing? Yes, Mr. Cox says, Product is only worth what a consumer is willing to pay for it. Well, what are they willing to pay for it? And that's not the easiest bit of research for you to do, but that's kind of an important thing, right? 
you've got a restaurant, let's say you're trying to bring Chick-fil-A to Guatemala or whatever, right? You ought to know whether or not there's other companies or other restaurants, other local places that are selling chicken sandwiches and you better figure out in local dollars how much are they charging for that. You've got to be somewhere in that range or else people not, are not going to buy your chicken sandwich even if it's the best chicken sandwich in the world, right? Now, I could be wrong. It could be like the Starbucks of chicken and they're like, oh wow, you know, I will pay whatever price for it and only certain people will go there and be exclusive and we don't have to change a thing and we can charge up for it. That's possible too. But research, you have to do the research to figure out whether or not that indeed is the case. Right? What kinds of discounts are normal, if any? Right? Does it cheapen the quality, the perceived quality of the product if you're not charging enough for it or if you're just giving away discounts? It's like, am I desperate to get rid of this thing? Right? Different people from different cultures may look at that in different ways. Um, how do people pay for your product? Do they use cash? Do they use credit? Do they link their phone on it? Do you bill them? How do you collect? And this may be specific to the kind of business, right? The way that we collect when we're in a restaurant is different from the way if we're doing like a, a service like carpet cleaning for commercial office space, right? Where we might give them an invoice and we expect them to pay us in a month, right? So how, how do we collect? How do we do that? All right, so you should be aware of strategic pricing. Either you can use it, or you can be the victim of it. <laughs> but it's important to know about this stuff. So predatory pricing. This is when, it, when they use profit gain in one market to support aggressive pricing designed to drive competitors out in another market. So after the competitors have left, the firm will raise prices and earn higher profits. So a classic example of this is in the TV market. Um, the Japanese wanted to gain in an inroad into the American market and basically jacked up the prices of TVs in Japan so that they could sell them for super cheap in the United States and so one market basically paid for the other so that they could try to put the other competitors out of business and try to, to gain a foothold, right? So that's a pricing strategy, right? Walmart has also been, has engaged in predatory pricing as well particularly in the late 80s and early 90s when it was doing most of its growth. It was engaging in predatory pricing schemes in order to try to put small town businesses out of business. We'll talk about that next week or the week after, but the idea is, is that due to economies of scale, that is they are huge and they have this vast supply chain, they can make things more efficient and then undercut their competition, put them out of business and then turn around and jack up the prices later on. Um, they tried this in Germany and actually were unsuccessful. They pulled out of Germany in 2006. And why? Well, the German public was less interested in large stores that sell everything cheaply. Uh, at that time, retail chains were already failing, and so it was probably bad timing for them. And the German public tends to value quality products. And Walmart is known for doing extra cheap stuff. Maybe it's not the best quality, but hey, it's like if I've got a tight budget, then that's what I'm going to get. And so they ha had a harder time for that reason. They also had trouble outcompeting the small family run high street merchants. So exactly the same people they were able to put out of business in the United States, they had a much harder time doing it in Germany and there are probably several reasons for that, part of which has to do with labor costs, right? There are stronger unions and stronger labor laws in Germany and they had to pay workers relatively more than they could in the United States. And if your business model is to sell lots of things cheaply, you can't very well do that if you pay your workers a lot. And so that's, that becomes a whole, just, just challenging for their business model, makes it unable for them to do that. So that's predatory pricing, right? Now we have multi-point pricing. A uh, firm's pricing strategy in one market may have an impact on a rival's pricing strategy in another market. So if you're competing against the same company across countries, you have to adapt your price to what your competitors are doing. Again, this is a classic example of this. So Fujifilm, which is a Japanese film company, wanted to try to make inroads in the United States, and they cut their prices by about 50%. And Kodak was huge in America being an American company. And Kodak's like, geez, we don't want to have to cut our prices. What are we going to do here? So what they ended up doing is radically cutting their prices in Japan. And so you kind of had a price war from between in two different countries with these two competing companies. So they eventually had to back off and level off and, and so on. But 
it's just an example of how you've got a major competitor, and if you're dealing in two countries, that may, they may be interrelated. And then there's experience curve pricing. Um, you price low worldwide in an attempt to build global sales volume as rapidly as possible, even if this means taking large losses initially. So firms that are further along the experience curve have a cost advantage relative to firms further up the curve. So again, we talked about Walmart, for example, being able to take advantage of economies of scale. The better that businesses get at this, the easier it is for them to try to engage in strategic pricing to try to put other people out of business. Okay, how do regulations influence pricing? Um, there are some anti-dumping regulations. So to prevent uh, foreign competitors from undercutting local prices or from saturating the market with too much of something, then sometimes countries, as we've spoken about before, will say, our policy is that, you know, we're going to put a quota on how much of a certain product is going to come into the, to our market, and that's going to limit uh, that access so that they can't dump on the market. So it doesn't sort of bottom out the price of something and make it difficult for our homegrown businesses to operate. Or competition policy. Most industrialized nations have regulations to, designed to promote competition and res restrict monopolistic practices as well. Um, so place, right? I, I put in parentheses distribution strategy. Right? Because we're not just talking about a location, we're also talking about how it is that we get whatever it is we're selling to whoever it is we're selling it to. So how do we deliver our product service? Where are you located? Those are the key questions. So what is your place? Um, this is an important question. Where are you going to operate? Specifically, where are you going to be? In what city are you going to be? Can you isolate it to a neighborhood? You know, you, you do need to think a little bit about like what kind of area would a restaurant do well? Do I need to be in the same kind of area that's zoned for restaurants? Is it not necessary to do that, right? So um, does your location even matter, right? It definitely does if it's like a, a department store, a restaurant, you know, a, a chain store. Does location matter with manufacturers? So you don't need to be where all the restaurants are. You want to be where the roads are, where the trains are, where the, the waterways are. Absolutely, right? Uh, personal sales calls, right? Does it matter if I'm making personal sales calls, if I'm using a push strategy to try to sell my stuff, you know, does it matter where I am? And the answer could be maybe so, maybe not. If I'm doing it all digitally, then maybe I could sit at my home and do it, right? But if there's a certain group of clients and I have to go visit them locally, then I probably want to be relatively in their area so I can go around and do that. I have to mention carpet cleaning joints because I own a carpet cleaning place. And that's an interesting question. Right? We were kind of located in a not very good area of Topeka when I was originally running this place. And it, it really, our location really didn't matter, except that we had to be drivable. We had to be close enough to the people we were serving that it wasn't going to burn up a lot of gas. I don't need to, we don't need to look pretty. We don't need to be among the nice looking stores. Nobody's going to go into our place unless they're working for us. So then there's a question, how do you get your product to your customer? Where do you keep inventory? How do you get your inventory to your place of business? These are location and distribution questions. So how do distribution systems differ? Uh, four main differences. One is retail concentration. So it could be concentrated, that is few retailers, or fragmented, like in a lot of developing countries. Places like the United States, you'll find that there may be less con less, fewer retailers and less competition. Right? You've got a Target, you've got a Walmart, you've got fewer of these little mom and pop shops all over the place that you would probably choose. And they're big established companies that you go to and like it or not, you know, I could be going to Overland Park, Kansas and a lot of those businesses are going to look the same as they do in Denton, Texas, in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm going to find my Beth Band Bath, I can't speak. I could find my Bed Bath and Beyond and it's, it's going to be there, right? That's not to say that there aren't some major retailers in developing countries or in other parts of the world, but some markets are more fragmented. So it might be that there's dozens of competitors, little mom and pop shops selling different things, and it's not nearly as consolidated. Part of that has to do with maybe the, the difficulty of access of some countries getting into, or I should say, some companies trying to get to certain places. It may be a virtue of um, infrastructure. 
you know, are you able to sort of like gather that much stuff in one place and make it work? You know, those of you who are thinking about larger enterprises, you know, you have to think about that when you're thinking about location. But being aware, you know, do, it's a key question. You know, are your com competitors um, a couple of big ones or are they a whole lot of small ones? And where are they? And how are they competing with you? But understanding what that looks like matters. Because if you're a chain, like if, you, if you're bringing in a major retailer, knowing that some people are probably getting their stuff not from other major retailers, it may be an advantage to you or it may be a serious point of competition that you may not be able to beat like Walmart couldn't do in Germany. Channel length, the number of intermediaries between the producer and the consumer, direct or through intermediaries. So I think about the food industry, for example. Direct channel would be like, you know, I'm a farmer and I pulled my stuff out and I put it in the truck and I went down to the market and you come to that farmer's market and you're buying it straight from me. Okay, that's a very, very short channel, right? Most food products don't work that way. Most have food brokerages. They're basically a middleman between the people who make and produce the food and warehouse the food and the grocery stores. So they write these promotions, which basically is whatever the price is going to be. They help determine the price in conjunction with the company. And then they go over to the grocery tour store and they say, this is how much you're going to charge for it. So between the producer, whoever processes or cuts the meat or takes the corn off of the stalk or whatever, to wherever they store it, and then the food broker, it, broker figures out like how that gets to the supermarket, which then gets to you, that's a very elongated um, channel length. So understanding how long that channel is is going to affect the way that you do it because it may be different in one country versus another as far as how, how long that channel is. Channel exclusivity. How difficult it is for outsiders to access the channel. I've had people try to bring beer to the UK before or to Belgium. Now Belgium, of course, the market's ma massively saturated. you got like loads and loads of beer. One time I had a student wanted to do a business plan and they were, the idea was they wanted to try to bring Boulevard to Britain. And they had a great plan, they had all sorts of great ideas. The challenge is though, in that particular market, is that it's a very, very closed market for alcohol. So the way it works there is that there are a few major producers that are aligned with the distributors of beer. And then certain pubs, public houses, will be aligned with those companies. So if you go into to most pubs in Britain, there's sort of like a set of like five or six major beers that you're going to find in those places. Um, and it's not just because they're the most popular beer. They're going to get whatever InBev has on tap, or they're going to have whatever the big beer maker is, right? That's who they're beholden to because, again, sort of like vertical structures, it's like they're, you've got the people who make the beer connected to the people who distribute the beer. And so if, you're, if you want to bring Boulevard into a British pub, it's got to be in one of those free houses. And there you might find, you know, what they call real ales, ales that are maybe produced locally under different sorts of standards and stuff like that. Or you could do what some microbreweries do in Britain, and that is open your own pub and just have your own stuff there. And so this idea that you could just sort of like bring a beer into Britain and hope that somebody's going to buy it, it's a, it's a much more difficult prospect than it is in many parts of the world. And that was the challenge that this person had to kind of deal with is like, okay, so you want to bring Boulevard there, fair enough. How are you going to make that happen? How are you going to get past that sort of um, really exclusive channel that they have? So that's channel exclusivity then channel quality the expertise, competencies, and skills of established retailers in a nation and their ability to sell and support the products of international businesses. You've got this great idea. You want to bring this business to another country, yet maybe not a lot of people are doing it, or maybe nobody's doing it, and the, the stuff that you need may not be developed enough to make it work in the way you want it to work, right? So we talked about this before when it comes to first mover status, right? If you're the first mover, could be awesome, you could be the first one, you could make loads of money. 
But if you're the first mover, it probably also means that it doesn't have all the things that you need. So you have to provide those things, or you have to build those things, or you have to establish those things. You have to connect to whatever it is that exists there to build the infrastructure, to do the things that you need to make happen. If you are taking a business or a product to some place, and that kind of business and that kind of product already exists and already does okay there, you may be able to assume that there is enough expertise, competencies, and skills, in, in, and for that matter, the infrastructure, the retailers, the ability to sell, right? All, all the stuff that goes into it, hopefully, is already going to be there. A quality channel is one in which that stuff's there. You could just sort of slide in there and make it work. And if it's not, then, then it's harder. There's more stuff to think about. The flip side of that is, is that if other people are doing it, it may mean that your market's saturated and you may have to go someplace else where that isn't there. But then that's the double-edged sword. You go someplace where that stuff doesn't exist and your expertise and competencies and skills and so on aren't probably going to be nearly as good. So next is promotion. And next to promotion, I also have communication strategy. right? So we're not just talking about putting out advertisements or coming up with clever ways to try to make your product known, you're talking about a general way also of communicating with your consumer, how it is that you get these customers uh, to connect. So it includes communicating with customers through direct selling, sales, promotion, direct marketing, advertising, and it includes the expertise, competencies, and skills of established retailers in a nation and their ability to sell and support the products of international businesses. We'll talk about push or pull strategy in a little bit. So, promotion. So this is the easy part for most people. How does your business promote its product or service? Again, I probably don't have to ask you guys this question at this point. You probably know. But the question is, is it going to be the same in the country you're going to? Right? How is it different? Is it, you know, if, if you've got a restaurant, for example, are you going to be able to do commercials the way you did, you did them back here? You know, so what kind? Which ones? Radio, television, you're going to do banner ads, or do not as many people look at those? Um, what I want to look at now is product and communication strategy. Um, so part of this goes back to what we talked about when we talked about international strategy. And that is there's sort of a debate or kind of a, a tension between standardization and customization um, and costs. So if you've got something that you standardize, then it's going to be cheaper and easier because you don't have to change anything and you can continue to make it whatever price you're going to make it at. That makes things less expensive, right? Where if you're customized things, you're specializing things, then that's going to involve higher levels of cost. So keep in mind that's not an all or nothing thing. There are some things you may standardize and some things you may customize. And so this strategy sort of addresses both of them. Right? Under what circumstances do you or should you do one or the other or, or both? So first we'll look at product extension and communication extension. So what that means is that a business is going to take their product as it is and they're just extending it. They're just moving it someplace else, just like I said before. But they'll do the same thing with their communication strategy, which means that what, however it is they sell their stuff, or however they communicate here, they're going to do it every place else too. So just like with our global strategy model, this is an inexpensive way to make it work if you can make it work. So you standardize both all across the globe. It's cost effective, allows for greater economies of scale. Most of the time it's used for industrial type products, right? Because you don't have to, to make them pink. You don't have to make the gears taste good, right? It's just the gear has to fit in the machine, right? There are some consumer products that it works for, like soft drinks. You know, we talked about Coca-Cola before, how you know, you can, they, they don't have to change that much about what they do. And between the product itself and the way they sell it, it's pretty much identical. I mean, all you have to do, look at a pack, look at a Coke can, right? It's like, this is, it's in Arabic here, but you turn the Coke can around, it's still got the English Coca-Cola on it. You know, it, it, it maintains that same image, that same mode of selling, and so they can use basically the same communication strategy, right? Starbucks is another great example of that. We talked about that with the global strategy, how you don't have to change the nature of the product because people freaking love it just the way it is, right? But 
your storefront is the same, the inside of the store is the same, the way you sell it is the same. I mean, like, they don't have to do anything different because it's a luxury type good. I mean, even for us, for those of us who are sort of middle class, it's like, I'm gonna spend that much on a coffee, I guess I will, I'm treating myself. You know, it's not run of the mill coffee for most people, and that certainly is the truth around the world as well. That's how it's perceived. It's not the, the, cheap, the cheap coffee. All right, then we have uh, option two, which is product extension communication adaptation. So what you're doing is you're taking whatever the product is, right, not changing it, but you are changing the way that you are communicating it or advertising it, presenting it. So you've got different communication strategies across the globe. It's cost effective because communication adaptation is less expensive than tailoring the product to a local market. And it can be used for, for some consumer type products, bicycles for example, like I don't probably have to change the physical aspect of a bicycle in order to sell it just about anywhere. It works the way it works and you know they do a good job with that. You know, here's another example is uh, the movie Spider-Man 3 broke box office records in India because it was translated into five different regional languages there. And so simply by diversifying literally the way it communicates, they took the same product and then just made it more accessible to more people by doing that. All right, the next one we have is product adaptation and communication extension. That is, we're going to change the product somehow, but we're gonna sell it in the same way. We're gonna communicate in the same way. We're gonna advertise it in the same way. So changes made to the product, same communication strategy across the globe. Product formulations are changed, sometimes without the consumers even knowing it. Um, it involves research, development, expenses, tooling costs, all stuff which is expensive. Um, doesn't allow for economies of scale because like what I do with Tide, I have to do differently here than I do over here. So the product e expenses are, are higher, but you do achieve some savings if you can more or less keep the logo, advertise it the same way, right? Make things as consistent as possible. In India, Tide eliminated softeners in order to reduce the price of the detergent for consumers and it was cheaper for them to manufacture it. So that, that made it work for them. And they would have outpriced themselves in the market if they hadn't done something to change that formulation. And then we have product adaptation and communication adaptation, right? You do both. Is that you're recognizing the socio-cultural differences from country to country. Uh, to make this option profitable, foreign market or markets need to be of sufficient volume. Right? If you're going to go through that much effort to change your product and change your communication strategy, that's a high price thing. You know, you really have to have sufficient volume in order for it to be worth your while to make that kind of money. And then, um, and it calls for extensive research and development expenses and tooling costs. What are the barriers to international communication? Um, the effectiveness of a firm's international communication can be jeopardized by a few things. Cultural barriers can be difficult to communicate messages across cultures. One of the classic examples that they often use in business classes is the Chevy Nova, which supposedly said no go, and it was a horrible marketing campaign. I will tell you that, as a matter of fact, that probably is a, um, an urban legend. That probably was something that never really happened, even though it actually made it, its way into real business books. But I think it's been kind of debunked since then. But that's not to say that kind of thing doesn't happen. That kind of thing does happen. And you know you don't have to go very far to sort of realize that sometimes our marketing strategies fall flat and they don't work or we say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and it may be difficult. Parker Pens had a fun time explaining themselves after bringing their product to Spain and promptly assuring people it wouldn't get them pregnant. The slogan was, it won't leak in your pocket and embarrass you. But it translated to, it won't leak in your pocket and make you pregnant. A soft drink that brings your ancestors back to life. Pepsi was trying to crack the Chinese market but ended up with a highly offensive campaign. Instead of promoting their famous slogan, come alive with Pepsi generation, they marketed themselves by accidentally saying, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. Mm, Yay! <laughs> Um, source and country or of origin effects. 
When the receiver of the message evaluates the message on the basis or status or image, or the basis of status or image of the sender, should you de-emphasize the foreign origins, for example, right? I have a picture here of Joe's Barbecue, which is a famous barbecue joint. It's awesome here in Kansas City. And Kansas City, of course, is the best place for barbecue in the world. Somebody I, I know tried to take a Kansas City barbecue place and move it to Australia. And Australia is a big barbecue place too, right? And so they think that that's a good fit. So I don't have an answer to this, but it's a fundamental question. When you go there, do you go there as a Kansas City barbecue place because that makes it special, that makes it different? Or do you try to compete with Australians on their own terms? You know, what does the market call for? What do they want? What do they need? And you could say, well, it, it should say Joe's Barbecue because that's special, that's unique. But you go to Sydney and people would be like, where's Kansas City? And they do what? You know, and they don't get the connection. So then how much more selling or marketing or communication do you have to do in order to make people realize you've got a special thing sitting right here? <laughs> or do you just do barbecue better than everybody else? How do firms communicate with customers? Firms have to choose between two types of communication strategies, push strategy or pull strategy. So push strategy is personal selling, and a pull strategy is mass media advertising. So when you're doing push, it's like, okay, I'm selling pharmaceutical products. I have to go visit doctor's offices and try to get these doctors to try to push these pharmaceuticals on, my pa on their patients, right? And that's a push strategy, right? Pull strategy is like, I'm putting all the advertisements out there and I expect you to come to my target store and buy my stuff, right? I am pulling you in. Now, it's funny I just mentioned pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals technically do a little combination of both in the United States, and then in the United States we have loads of these crazy pharmaceutical commercials, and so they're hoping for a pull strategy where it's like, hi, I have problems, I need Ozempic. And they go ask their doctor for a prescription. Please ask your doctor for a prescription. And they do and then that bumps up their sales like crazy. In many parts of the world, it is just a push strategy. Those kinds of, of commercials are not allowed. They're illegal in many parts of the world, but not in America. What's the optimal mix? In general, push strategy is better for industrial products or complex new products, um, when distribution channels are short, when few print or electronic media are available, or pull strategy is better. Like for consumer goods, again, you put out the ad, they come to your store, great. Uh, when distribution channels are long. Again, I think about the uh, food industry, right? Having a grocery store and letting people know that your food is there is a better way to do it. You know, they're not going to bring the food to you, you have to go to the store to get the food. And when sufficient print and electronic media are ava available to carry the marketing message, right? So. If you want to do a pull strategy, you've got to have, again, the infrastructure to support that. You have to have the technology, you have to have the TV, the cell phones, the, all that stuff in order to make it happen. Or, I don't know, if you're in a small village or something like that, you put up posters, you know, there's a pull strategy for you. But you have to have that strategy that's going to be appropriate to wherever it is. It's a competitive analysis. You need to analyze your competition. So the key question you should ask yourself is what makes or breaks your company success in a country? Who is your competition? We've alluded to this before. Are they global competitors? Are they local ones? Now when you put together an initial proposal and you're doing a regional analysis, you really are looking at global competitors or regional competitors, you know, ones that might compete in what, Southeast Asia or Central America or whatever area of the world it is that you're talking about. But now that you're at a point where you're focusing on a specific country, maybe a specific city, maybe a specific neighborhood, right? Who really are your other people buying from? Whose market are you capturing? And so that is a much more specific question. So you explore and research the track record of other companies already located in that country. Evaluate the reasons that other companies are successful in that country. So. What cultural challenges might you have to consider when communicating with customers and clients? One is different communication styles. Different attitudes toward conflict. 
But there are different cultural attitudes toward that. There are some that are very direct in the way, like, hey, there's a problem. Let's go at it right now. We're going to duke it out, and when we're done, we'll, we'll be done. And others that are a little more conflict averse, like, okay, let's avoid confronting each other about anything. Problem's going to go away. We'll get to it sooner or later in time, right? These are differences between people, but it's also differences between cultures. Different approaches to completing tasks, right? Different <laughs> attitudes toward time, right? It's like, how, how punctual is punctual? When do you show up for meetings, you know? When, how, how much flexibility am I going to give somebody if they're 15 minutes late? Um, do you work in teams? How do those teams operate? Um, what's your attitude toward task completion? Uh, how are resources allocated? And so those cultural differences may affect uh, your outcomes. Different decision-making styles. Right? Is one person going to make all the decisions? Is it culturally appropriate to delegate? At who can you delegate to? How much can you delegate? Right? Can people lower down? Can they make key decisions? Or are they just doing what the person on top does? Um, different attitudes toward disclosure. Right? Do you expose emotions? Do you share personal information? Or is it culturally inappropriate to do some of those things? This is, these are all things that we've talked about here. Right? We've gone through the four Ps, product, price, place, promotion. We've talked briefly about competitive analysis, some challenges on customer and client communication. So this should be enough, hopefully, that you feel like you can work on a business plan, right? So that's, that's my intention here, is by going through all of this stuff and doing so in detail, then I'm working in a lot of marketing theory and a lot of global management stuff, but it's stuff that hopefully you will be able to apply in a practical way. So global marketing, it's a huge subject. They have entire college courses devoted to just to this particular study. I clearly can't cover every element of that in a video such as this. But I hope that you've learned just enough anyway to try to help you understand global marketing more, and particularly in such a way that you can apply it to a business plan, that you can use this information to try to convince someone that your idea to take a business and put it someplace else in the world is a good one. So for Beyond Profit, Global Perspective, I'm Mark. I'll see you next time.